16, 1 through 13. 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 13. <clears throat> I know that's several verses to read, but I, I, I looked at this passage and uh, I just said, uh, I really can't skip around because we're going to miss some uh, pieces, and so we're just going to have to read uh, 13 verses tonight. So uh, if you're lagging behind on your Bible reading today, uh, this will help you get caught up. All right. <clears throat> so 1 Samuel chapter 16, 1 through 13. If you're there, shout amen. amen. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go if Saul hear it? Remember, Saul's still the king. Okay, if Saul hear it, he'll kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peace, peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Let's read this together. Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, Son number two, and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made number three, Shammah, to pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and <clears throat> brought him in. Now he was ruddy, and with all of a beautiful countenance, ruddy means rosy-cheeked, and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him. For this is he. And then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, for the grace of God. It's already been mentioned here tonight. Now, Lord, I pray that you will just revive our hearts and our spirits tonight and minister to us around the table of your word. Speak it into our lives, Lord. May we apply it to our lives and be transformed by the renewing of our minds. In Jesus' name, all God's people shout amen. Amen, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I want to just share with you a few moments tonight on the subject, the Museum of God's Grace. The Museum of God's Grace. Let me start because I'm, I'm kind of a, maybe a little uh, trivia junkie. Uh, I like uh, some facts, especially about uh, Scripture and about the, the Bible. Um, and it's uh, interesting to me that David is mentioned in the Bible uh, more than any other person. Uh, I've not counted, but I have read that the ones that have counted claim that David's name occurs uh, three times more often 
than either Abraham or Moses. Uh, he's mentioned even more than Christ. Over 1,100 times David's name is mentioned in Scripture, uh, including uh, 58 times in the New Testament. Uh, four books, total of about 61 chapters of the Old Testament, tell David's story. Uh, it's believed that he wrote at least uh, about 73 of the Psalms, uh, and in the 30 centuries since his death, uh, he has been uh, painted, he has been sculpted, he has been idolized, uh, mortalized, uh, and to this day, we still name our children after him, all right? And uh, when you look at his resume, it's quite full. Uh, being Jesse's, uh, Jesse's youngest son, uh, being a teenage shepherd, uh, being Saul's court musician, uh, being a giant slayer, uh, spending about 10 years of his life as a fugitive on the run, uh, Jonathan's closest friend, uh, you'll find on his resume, a hero to thousands, uh, Israel's greatest king. He was a poet uh, of exceptional skill. He was a gifted architect. Uh, he was, from what we understand in Scripture, handsome and charismatic. Uh, as far as his leadership, he was loved, absolutely loved by the multitudes. But he was also an adulterer, and he was a murderer. Uh, he was a father to a son who turned against him and actually attempted to steal from him the entire kingdom. Uh, and from obscurity, he, he rose to lead his nation to what historians say was their greatest days. And yet through his own foolish choices, David destroyed his family, basically. He ended his reign amid uh, trouble and intrigue, um, intrigue, a, a glorious triumph in one sense, but on the other side of the coin, a very human tragedy. He was called and gifted, but he was human to the core. He was a paradox. He was strong in battle, but from all instances from what it looks like in scripture he was weak at home he danced he wept he laughed he cried he poured out his heart in worship before the lord but he failed as a parent and he reaped a lot of sorrow from it so in a sense he's really not like michelangelo's polished marble statue in Florence, Italy. Really, he's like any of us. Entirely human, made of flesh and blood, and totally flawed. And yet, what God said of him catches us off guard because God said of David, and of no one else in Scripture, he said, here's a man after my own heart. So my goal tonight is simple. I, I want us to see how David, this obscure young shepherd, became king over Israel. And by what path? By what path did God lead him from the sheep pen to the palace and I'll just go ahead and answer that God led him down the pathway that I want to call grace hello and now that we've discovered that path I want us to see ourselves tonight as we travel that path as well 
Because, church, in learning about David, we're really learning about ourselves. And in learning how God worked with him, we are really learning how God works with us. And in learning about his struggles, we're really learning about our own struggles. And just as God made a king out of David, how many know God is at work, Peter said, to make kings and priests out of each of us? So that's where we're going tonight. And, and uh, so you're going to help me preach? Good, good. I'm glad because some of you are looking like your dog died. <laughs> the story begins uh, in the text. We find David is tending sheep on the rocky hills near Bethlehem. I've been there, and they are very rocky. And what I want us to see first and foremost is that David, rising to be king, was entirely God's choice. From a human point of view, he was really the least likely person to ever become king. But as we are about to see, God often chooses the most unlikely of candidates, those whom the world overlooks. And he takes him and he calls him to do his will. Notice we pick up the story with the conversation taking place between, first of all, God and Samuel. Now, to understand these verses, you you really need some background information. Saul had been the people's choice for their leader. They looked around at the culture of their day, and they saw that every other nation around them had a king. God's design for Israel was different, though. God wanted to be their king. He would be the one to take care of them. He would be the one to protect them. He would be the one to provide for them. Over and over again, he had demonstrated he was well-equipped for the job, right? But they wanted an earthly king so they could be like all the other nations. And so they had pestered Samuel, their resident prophet, until he finally said, Lord, these people really want a king. And the Lord said, okay, give them one. And so to his credit, in a sense, I think there was... There probably wasn't a better man for the job than Saul from a total earthly standpoint. He was an impressive young man, uh, seemed to be talented. And so for a while, it was all rosy until something happened inside of Saul. There was an impulsive streak that made him act without thinking and unfortunately it wasn't minor things it wasn't just side issues he was guilty of big things everybody say big things like deliberately disregarding the word of God how many know that's a big thing that's a big thing and you'll never get by when you do that. And ultimately, the day came when God said, I've had enough of him. I'm going to remove your kingdom from you, Saul, and I'll give it to another man after my own heart. And one of the saddest commentaries, really, I think, in all the Bible is found in the closing verse of First Samuel 15, where we discover Samuel the prophet is mourning Weeping for Saul. He's not dead, but he's been rejected. And God, we find with Samuel in the end of that chapter, is regretting that he ever allowed Samuel to make Saul king. 
But in verse 1 of chapter 16, our text, there comes this time when God says to Samuel, you've cried long enough. Israel wants this new king, or needs really, they, they still had Saul, but God said I'm through with him. And, and, uh, and so he says to Samuel, basically, Israel needs this new king. I'm, I'm choosing a new one. And since I've rejected Saul, get up. Samuel, get up, dry your tears, fill up your, your horn with oil, and get ready to travel because I'm sending you to the home of a man named Jesse who lives in Bethlehem, and I've chosen one of his sons to be king. Now understand, when Samuel goes to uh, Bethlehem, he doesn't know how God's choice is going to be revealed. He is just supposed to go to Bethlehem, to the house of Jesse, and the rest is up to God. The rest will be made clear when he gets there. So here we discover, I think, one of the first great lessons from this story before we ever meet David. And that is, if you want to know God's will for tomorrow... Get up, wash your face, brush your teeth, have you some breakfast, and go out the door and do God's will today. Oh, some of you done missed it. It done flew over your head. In doing God's will today, you will discover God's will for tomorrow. He's not going to reveal his will for tomorrow if you're not doing his will for today. So while Saul was, was flaming out, basically, God has already chosen his man. And Saul's failures how many know Saul's failures didn't catch God off guard? And they certainly didn't upset God's work. Listen, if one man won't do God's will, somebody else will. If you don't tithe, somebody else will. If you don't want to obey God, somebody else. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If you don't want to surrender to Christ and give Him everything, commit to Him, somebody else will. God's did all He's going to do, He sent His Son. He paid the highest price for our obedience. If we say no, he moves on to the next one. Amen. So always remember, while we sit around and cry the blues and moan and groan, God is already at work behind the scenes. I thought it was interesting after World War II had been won, someone asked Winston Churchill. They said, uh, what were you doing during the dark days of the Blitz when the Nazis were raining bombs on London? And Churchill replied and he said, I was in the basement planning the invasion of Europe. What was God doing while Saul was self-destructing? He was preparing David to be king. No one knew it but God. And Samuel didn't know, Saul certainly didn't know, Jesse didn't know, and David himself had no clue. Are you uncertain and worried maybe about the future? Maybe you're fearful over what might happen next? I want you to rest tonight in two words. God knows. <laughs> I thought this afternoon... I'm thankful there's no panic buttons in heaven. 
Hello. God is not up in heaven pacing back and forth with, with a migraine saying, oh, I never saw that one coming. While you stay up and worry, how many know he's already up, he's ahead of us, and he's arranging the details? So let that thought lift your spirits tonight, beloved. Wait on the Lord, listen for his voice, rest in him, take the next step in front of you, be encouraged, child of God. We don't know what the future holds, but the hymn writer said, we know who holds the future. Praise God. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, God knows. All right. So there's a conversation there, first of all, in the text between Samuel and God. Next, the conversation is a scene between Samuel and Jesse's sons. So in time, we find that Samuel makes his way to the house of Jesse, and he asks to see all of his sons. And the Bible doesn't really say if he told Jesse what was on his mind. But it doesn't matter because Samuel was well known throughout Israel. It would have been a great honor to have this prophet visit your home. So so Jesse gladly calls all of his sons, and and they line up, and, and the first one's introduced. He says, meet this one. His name is Eliab. And evidently, he looked a bit like Saul, tall, handsome. He must have, been impre- uh, must have impressed Samuel because when Samuel sees Eliab, he thinks, all right, Lord, good choice. He even looks like a king. But the Lord says to Samuel, what are you talking about? That's not the one. In fact, I've rejected him. So in comes the next son. The next son, number two, is named Abinadab. And this time Samuel doesn't really say anything according to the text. He just waits for God's voice. And God basically says, no. Go to the next son. Nope. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. Yeah. Samuel is zero for seven in picking the next king of Israel. He is completely mystified. He has come to anoint the new king, but the new king is nowhere to be found in Jesse's house. Before I go on, I first want to go back to Jesse's first son, Eliab, because Samuel assumed in advance that he knew God's will, but how many know he was wrong? He was wrong. He was repeating the same mistake the nation had made earlier, which was he wanted someone who looked like a king. When he saw Eliab, he assumed he must be the man that God had in mind. There is something very human, I think, about this whole scene. One by one, the brothers anxiously parade in front of the prophet. One by one, the answer comes back, no, not him. Samuel should have learned from his experience with Saul. We have, I think, the same tendency today to flirt with Eliab even when we've been burned by Saul. Because we, we, we never seem to learn. How many's ever made the same mistake twice? Oh, yeah. And, and we're impressed by outward success. We're impressed with the looks and the appearance and money and power and names and titles and connections and, and clothes and cars and degrees. But how many know God places none to little value on any of those things? By the way, we should ask, what was wrong with the seven brothers? Nothing really. The text never says anything negative about them. Eliab and the others were no doubt fine gentlemen who could qualify for just about any job in the world except one which was king of Israel. Because God had already filled that position, uh, Samuel just had to get on the same page with God. And so in reality, we're not so different from ancient Israel after all because even in the church, maybe I should say especially in the church, we like to pay attention to how people look. Hello? We notice who drives the nice cars, who wears the stylish clothes, where they work, that sort of thing. But don't be surprised, beloved, if God doesn't raise up a kid from a dysfunctional family, transform his heart, and call him to be the next deacon or Sunday school teacher. 
Praise God. How many know it can happen because God's done it before and he can do it again? Finally, the last scene here, uh, the focus falls on Samuel and David. Okay, so finally Samuel says, by the way, you don't happen to have any other sons, do you, Jesse? Just an afterthought, a shot in the dark. Jesse says a strange thing. Uh, yes, I do. But he's the youngest. He's, he's out tending the sheep. And, 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 and you know what that means? It means he's, he's just a kid, and he really doesn't count for much. You wouldn't want him anyway. That was Jesse's way of saying, he doesn't have the makings of a king. Now, every child that was the youngest in your family knows exactly what's going on here in the text. Because uh, it's like this. The firstborn in the family comes along, and it's like they get everything they want. All right? All the privileges start with him. Then it goes second, third, fourth, right on down to the baby. Well, if you're that last kid, good luck because you're going to need it. Be sure to wear your name tag because we'll probably forget who you are. Huh? If you have a photo album, the first 200 pictures are the oldest child. Right? That first child. The next 50 are the second and maybe 10 or 15 for the third. After that, it's all group pictures. Huh? And if you're the fifth child, your first picture comes the day you graduate from college. Yippee. Huh? Back to our text. While all his brothers are with Samuel, David is out with the sheep. He doesn't know anything's even been going on. And his father don't even think enough of him to call him in from the field. But Samuel said, go get him. No doubt Jesse shrugged his shoulders and said, whatever you say, but he's just a kid. I still don't think he's the one you're looking for. And soon the Bible says as David comes, he comes straight from the sheep pasture. He hasn't had time to wash up. He hasn't had time to change his clothes. Do you know what you smell like after working with a bunch of sheep all day? Not Tommy Hilfiger. Huh? More like organic fertilizer. But here stands the the future king of Israel, maybe 14, 15, 16 years old, a shepherd, a poet, a dreamer. He doesn't look like a king, but it doesn't matter. Because God has found his man. And God says to Samuel, all right, anoint him. And Samuel does. That, my friend, still didn't make him king. In fact, I'm not sure that David had any idea what that anointing meant. It's not clear that Samuel explained it to Jesse or or David what this was all about. And it really didn't matter because the anointing, though, was God's way of saying, this is my man, and when the time comes, he will be king. So there's one more detail in this story I want you to make sure not to miss. The Bible tells us in verse 13, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Oh, may it be said of the young people in our church in Broadway Assembly that the Spirit of the Lord can come upon them from this day forward. They may look like a kid, but you don't know. They just might be a king in their heart. And listen, I don't know everything that this means, that the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. But at the very least, I believe this anointing was God's way of saying, Son, you are now 
You are now mine. You have my favor and you have my blessing. I have a plan for you. So what does that mean? It means that a day will come in the not too distant future from that date when David will walk down into the valley of Elah to face the giant named Goliath. And it will not be his own wisdom that saves him. It won't be his own education that saves him. It will not be his own strategy that saves him. It will be the God. God himself who anointed him is coming to fight for him. Praise God. And that's what the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I think, really, really means. God has found his man and he is going to make him successful. What everyone saw as just a kid, God saw as a king. And when God wanted to pick a leader for the nation of Israel, he didn't choose the MVP. Huh? What's that stand for? Most valuable player. No, he chose the LVP, the least valuable player. I imagine that when Jesse's uh, boys chose sides to, maybe they played stickball. I don't know what they played back then, but David was probably always picked last. And yet the truth remains, when God, though, wanted to raise up a king whose name would last for 3,000 years, uh, he went out into a pasture and found a smelly shepherd boy whose heart was open to him. And today in Israel, the national flag is called the Star of David. And when presidents and dignitaries visit Jerusalem, they stay in the King David's Hotel. Listen, what about Saul? Well, he's all but forgotten. Huh? Now, as we began, I, I said I wanted to look for the lessons that David teaches us so that we could learn from them as well. And since God has chosen us to, what should we learn from this? Well, first of all, this is a message for the forgottens of the world. Maybe the forgottens of the church. Uh, be encouraged by young David's example. When God wants to prepare us for bigger things, uh, he first teaches us to be faithful in the small things. Oh, that's good preaching, Pastor. Those who are called to be kings will not stay with the sheep forever. The world may be wrong in its estimation, but the voice of God still calls men and women today. I said he's still calling men and women today. And when God wants a man to be king, he first puts him with the sheep, but he won't stay there forever. Sooner or later, he's going to call him to the throne. And in the meantime, he must must be faithful. Turn to your neighbor and say, be faithful. If you find yourself forgotten and overlooked, remember David on the hillside and just remember he was faithful. Praise God. You still awake? Oh, good. Secondly, here's some lessons we learned. Secondly, there's, there's hope for those who are confused about the future. Not only should we be, would be encouraged by David's example, we can be reassured by Samuel's questions. Because Samuel had many questions about the future. First of all, he said, uh, Lord, I'm, I, I'll be in danger if, if Saul finds out I've went to anoint another king. Uh, 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 God, how would I know which one you're picking? How am I going to be sure about whole, how all this all is going to go down? And, and when he arrived at Jesse's house, he had no idea which son would be king. But he got up and journeyed to Bethlehem anyway. And David certainly didn't have a clue about what life had, 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 uh, uh, was holding for him. He simply came to the house when instructed and he stood silently and Samuel anointed him. And listen, it's been said, God's will is like a sunrise, not a sunburst. It reveals itself to us a little bit at a time. Our job is to take the next step and trust God for the rest. And I like the words uh, 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 Woody Allen said, if you want to know how to make God laugh, 
tell him your plans. Huh? Turn to your neighbor and say, he's right. He's right. If you don't know the future, though, fear not. In due time, God will make the way plain. He always does. How many know you can count on God? Praise God. I said somebody here tonight needs to be remembered and reminded you can count on God. And finally, I want you to see there's encouragement for those who wonder what God is doing. Because look at this. Israel's future seemed bleak once God rejected Saul. But this passage teaches us that man's disobedience cannot stop God's plans. And here's the fact. How many know God will have his way at the end? You better remember that. Beware of prejudging God based on what you see. You see this little bit and maybe another detail in this tiny little string and maybe a little piece over there and something else over here and you think, aha, now I got the picture. No, you don't. Hello. You barely see the ragged edge of God's plan. Don't judge God by what you can see. Perhaps the key verse of this chapter is verse 7. I had you read it together. Because Eliab looked apart, but David had the heart. One was rejected, the other was selected. And in the end, what others think of you doesn't matter. What God thinks makes all the difference in the world. And when God looks at your heart, what does he see? That's a good question because our understanding of God's omniscience leads us to conclude that God knew the trouble that David was going to get into before he was ever selected to be king. So how could God call a man like David to be king? Didn't God know about all the political maneuvering? Yes. Didn't God know about the marriages of convenience? Yes. Didn't God know about the affair with Bathsheba? Yes. Didn't God know about the murder of Uriah? Yes. Did God know about Absalom and how he would turn out? Yes. Didn't God know David was prone to depression and discouragement? Yes. Didn't God know how David's own family would disintegrate? Yes. God knew all those things and more. Besides, he knew what God, uh, he knew what David would do and he called him anyway. That, my friend, is what grace is all about. Oh, folks, they don't get any better than that right there. All those things are trumped by the prior fact that God chose David to be king and he was going to stand by his man. David, you murderer. David, you adulterer. David, you bandit. David, you poor excuse for a father. How can you claim to be a man after God's own heart? And the answer comes back, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's grace. I said, that is grace in action. Raise your hands and say, thank God for grace. Woo. I don't know about you, but I am so glad that it was a man like David who wrote Psalm 23. Hello. The man who wrote those words had experienced the depths of the grace of God. We study David's life so that couples whose children rebel and believers who have squandered one opportunity after another and Christians who have made the same stupid mistakes over and over again and teenagers who feel rebellious and forgotten and feel lonely and everyone whose life has been less than perfect will know Know that God can be your shepherd too. I said somebody shout, God is my shepherd. I'm feeling too good. Woo. Generations to come will say, oh no, we don't want David's failures. But listen, they want David's God. 
Hello. I said, they don't want David's failures, but we want David's God. And that's why he chose an unlikely shepherd to be Israel's greatest king. That's why his name appears in the Bible more than any other person. That's why 3,000 years later, parents are still naming their children after him. He was a man who thoroughly learned the most basic lesson of God's curriculum. And that is all of life must be lived by the grace of of God. Raise your hands and praise Him tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo! That'll wake you up. I think it's the meaning of that phrase, a man after God's own heart. It can't mean sinless perfection. It can't mean anything close to sinless perfection or else David would never qualify. Listen to pastor. I'm almost done. It can't mean above reproach or spotless reputation because those words, they don't fit David either. Hello? To be a man after God's own heart means... That because you understand that God never gave up on you. And that you will never give up on God. Because the bottom line of David is not his sin. The bottom line of David is the grace of God. David was God's man. His heart belonged to God. And that's why God used him. And that's why King David is exhibit A in the museum of God's grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the beginning of this story, no one believes in David but God. Not Jesse, not Samuel, only God. In the end, his family's broken, his nation is troubled, his closest friends are mostly gone. He discovers that God is still there. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for all my friends are with me. Huh? Is that what your version says? I will fear no evil, for Pastor Cruz is with me. He'd be a good one to have with you. But the best one you can have with you is God. David said, Thou art with me. God never gave up on David. That's grace. And thankfully, David never gave up on God. That's what it means to be a man after God's own heart. Stand with me. We've got testimonies here tonight. Of folks that God has delivered from from some pretty rough stuff. Hello. Some of you, even I, wouldn't have want to met you before you were saved. Huh? You rascal. Huh? But oh, thank God, as Brother Victor said it already. Thank God for his grace. Oh, thank God for his grace. He comes to us, Brother Victor, where we're at. And he takes us to where we need to go. He takes us and he does work in our heart. 
Everybody say, he's still working on me. On me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when he's done with Brother Victor, he can stand him right there in the museum of his grace. Victor looks over here and he sees David, a trophy of God's grace. He looks over here and he sees another character in the Bible, maybe, or maybe a friend, maybe an acquaintance that has allowed the grace of God to work in his heart. Folks, God won't do it without our cooperation. He's not going to come down and he's not going to force you to surrender. He's not going to force you to commit. He's not going to force you to come back to him. He simply stands at the door and he knocks. He said, if any man, boy or girl, hears my voice, he said, and you open the door. Couldn't a God that made this world, couldn't he go ahead and enter? Why, what's a door? A door shouldn't be able to keep him out. He's not going to force entry into anybody's heart. You got to want him and you've got to desire him the most, more than anything else in this culture, more than money in your bank account, more than a nice car out in the church parking lot, more than a nice home with, with all of the, the, uh, the nice uh, amenities. Listen, friend, you got to say, God, you're all I need. You're all I need. I'm tired of looking other places. I'm tired of searching here and searching there. Every head bowed and eye closed. I'm pulling for somebody. God is trying to let his grace. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Will you come? Will you slip out of your seat? We sung that song before we went to our text, Grace, Grace, God's Grace. The writer said in verse 3, he said, Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can we do to wash it away? He says, Look, there is a crimson tide. Brighter than snow you may be today. Oh, grace, grace. God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse. Anybody want to come? Anybody want to step out of your seat? Let God's grace revisit your, your soul tonight and let him touch you. He's able. Oh, I know grace, grace, God's grace. He spoke tonight, please don't take the words of the Holy Spirit lightly. The Holy Spirit is not someone to play with. Somebody, somebody, please, thank you, thank you for responding. My sin, grace, grace, 
God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all. Yes, avail yourself to the grace of God. 